You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from theheart.org on Medscape. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from theheart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for June 21st, 2019. This week, more on paclitaxel, spin, myocarditis, hard conversations, and TAVR in patients with end-stage renal disease. Last week, I reported on the paclitaxel controversy. This week, Patrice Wendling has great coverage of the FDA device panel advisory meeting. The top line, the committee unanimously agreed that there's a late mortality signal in patients with PAD, peripheral artery disease, treated with paclitaxel-coated balloons and stents, but they couldn't say why or whether there is a class effect, at least based on the existing data. Now, their meeting saw yet another updated meta-analysis, this one from the FDA agency, and it found a 57% increased mortality risk at five years with the paclitaxel-coated devices versus uncoated devices for the as-treated patients. Now, industry, of course, pushed back. They countered with their own analysis, none of which showed excess mortality. A panelist called this a, quote, forest of dueling numbers. Dr. Brand Zuckerman, the FDA chair of cardiovascular devices, said he would be careful with the most up-to-date industry numbers because they have not been checked by the FDA. I record this week in cardiology on Friday morning, so I won't be able to include day two of the FDA meeting. Stay tuned for next week. This is a big story, though, not just for the specifics of peripheral artery disease, which affects millions of patients, but also, I think, the larger picture of how we approve devices. The second story is about spin in health news. Now, I've recently discussed a study I was involved in that describes spin in the cardiovascular literature. Recall that spin is when scientist authors use manipulative language to highlight negative study findings. Well, spin can also occur downstream from the study in the news coverage. This isn't hardly news, but what is news, and described by a novel RCT, is that spin in news stories can exert strong effects on patients and caregivers. The authors of this study conducted three two-arm parallel group internet-based RCTs, which compared the interpretation of news stories that had and did not have spin. The RCTs included a preclinical study, a phase two study, and a phase three RCT. The authors found news articles that discussed the studies, and then they rewrote each without spin. The primary endpoint was participants' interpretation assessed by a simple question, and that was, what do you think is the probability that the treatment, treatment X, would be beneficial to patients, and the scale was 0, very unlikely, to 10, very likely. Not surprisingly, participants were more likely to consider that the treatment would be beneficial to patients when the news story was reported with spin. At each level of study, from preclinical to the phase 3 RCT, SPIN influenced people to see an intervention as more beneficial. BMC Medicine published this novel and important study, and the authors do a good job discussing the complexity of the, quote, ecosystem that leads to SPIN. Now, ecosystem, I mean, first we have the researchers, whose currency is positive studies, Then you have peer reviewers who also have cozy relationships with industry journals and often the authors. Then there are the journals who are incented to publish positive studies, which are more likely to be cited. And of course, the news organizations themselves have a business model supported by industry advertising, and hence, they too have a reason to make stories look good, as this drives views, which then affect ad revenue. In short, my friends, the entire ecosystem of health information is designed to dupe you with spin. Thus, I agree with the author's view that these findings have important public health consequences. I mean, I now have patients with no indication at all for AF ablation or watchmen coming to me asking if these interventions would help because of a news story. On some levels, this seems like a hopeless problem. I mean, 
Given the increasing degree to which healthcare dominates our economy, it's hard to imagine how to stop the spin. Well, here is where we medical conservatives have to stay together. We must continue to promote critical appraisal, slow medicine, and whenever possible, oppose spin candidly and publicly. I have a slide when I talk about social media that reminds me of the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson in his famous American Scholar Address in 1837. He essentially said that the academic has an obligation to think clearly, not influenced by tradition or historic views, and to think publicly. Third topic today is myocarditis. Inflammation of the heart used to be a rare thing. I've seen only very few cases over the decades I've practiced. But the use of immune checkpoint inhibitors by oncologists has changed that. As cited in a really nicely done news article by Roxanne Nelson, I learned that, quote, based on projections, about 600,000 patients a year will be eligible for an immune checkpoint inhibitor by 2020. Now, if 0.5% of these patients get myocarditis, then that is about 3,000 cases of myocarditis per year. This week's New England Journal featured two letters in which cases of resistant myocarditis, one from pembrolizumab or Keytruda, was cured by a monoclonal antibody known as elementuzumab. The authors say this is likely the first case of this novel therapy, commenting that elementuzumab is an extremely powerful drug, and as an analogy, while other MABs are more of a targeted strike, elementuzumab is like a nuclear bomb. The second case reported in the New England Journal describes how the use of abatacept, a selective T-cell co-stimulation modulator, led to resolution of a severe steroid-resistant myocarditis that was also induced by an immune checkpoint inhibitor. Abatacept is an agonist specifically targeting the pathways antagonized by immunotherapy for cancer, the immune checkpoint inhibitors. Okay, I know all of these terms are pretty technical, but it's this stuff is coming to you soon, not just in big referral centers, but anywhere cancer is treated. Cardiology will have to get reacquainted with myocarditis. Hopefully, most institutions will have parts of their group that are especially familiar with cardio-oncology. This is definitely no longer a niche branch of cardiology. I guess my final comment would be, that I sure hope cancer docs are only using these potentially dangerous cancer drugs if they've been proven effective in randomized controlled trials that measure overall survival, not the weaker progression-free survival endpoint. Next topic, speaking of cancer and other life-threatening diseases, there's a very poignant news story up on the heart.org Medscape Cardiology about having hard conversations. It's from Jonelle Alicia from Kaiser Health News, and she chronicles the remarkable story of internist Ron Nato from Oregon. Dr. Nato tells the story of how poorly he received the news of his stage 4 pancreatic cancer. I mean, one doctor refused to acknowledge the results of a sky-high blood test that showed signs of advanced cancer. Then after Dr. Nato had his biopsy, he overheard the specialist discussing the terrible results with a medical student outside the room. So what did Dr. Nato do after these botched conversations? He shared his experience with medical students at Oregon Health State University in a course called Living with Life-Threatening Illness. But that is not all. After enduring 10 rounds of chemo, he recently granted the OHSU Center for Ethics and Healthcare a million dollar grant to form a foundation in his name. Now, I highlight this story for many reasons. One is that although these are hard conversations, they definitely make you sad. But then, after I have them, as I pedal home, I think how lucky I am to be a doctor. I mean, the ablations and the devices, they're rewarding. But being in a position to really be with people in such a meaningful way, I think is far more remarkable than any procedure. I recently had a frank conversation with a patient about ICD deactivation, and he thanked me up and down for talking with him about this. And the other reason to highlight this story is that if a retired internist of 40 years can't get a frank conversation, you know we have serious problems. 
The author cited one study from an oncology journal that found only 5% of cancer patients accurately understand their prognosis. 5%. And I don't mean to pick on cancer docs. The heart failure in ICD literature is replete with studies showing how little patients understand about their prognosis. And my friends, this is a huge problem because when patients don't really understand their trajectory, they can't make good decisions about the remaining time they have. Now, if you remember one thing from today's podcast, please remember that hope is not a plan. It is not morbid to discuss death. It is our duty. Last topic today is about aortic stenosis and end-stage renal disease. Last week, I wrote and discussed the non-benefit of using defibrillators in patients with advanced kidney disease. This week, a registry study published in JAK revealed sobering data when TAVR, transaortic valve replacement, is used in patients with end-stage renal disease. It's well known previously that patients with end-stage renal disease who have surgical aortic valve replacement have higher rates of complications and higher mortality compared to patients without kidney disease. The question is, does the less invasive TAVR offer these high-risk patients a better option? Now, of course, the best way to answer this question would be with an RCT, but since that is unlikely to happen, numerous authors have reported on data from the TVT registry. This was about 72,000 patients were enrolled in this registry between 2011 and 2016, and of these 72,000, 3,000 had end-stage renal disease. The authors also analyzed outcomes into three categories of kidney disease that they created, end-stage renal disease, creatinine greater than 2 not on dialysis, and creatinine less than 2. Here are some of the top-line findings. Patients with end-stage renal disease were younger, more commonly diabetic and hypertensive. But despite the younger age, these patients were at significantly higher risk based on the STS score, and that's because of comorbidities. End-stage renal disease patients had much higher rates of vascular complications and major bleeding. Renal patients had significantly higher in-hospital and one-year mortality. And when patients were stratified by renal function, there was an incremental mortality risk. Dialysis patients, 37%. Creatinine greater than 2, 31%. And creatinine less than 2, 18%. And among a list of common comorbidities, dialysis use was one of the most strongly associated with one-year mortality. And I really like the author's words about patient selection. They were frank and clear, and given that spin is so prevalent in the cardiovascular literature, it was refreshing to read some of their discussion after his paper. Here's one quote, patients with end-stage renal disease who have severe AS still remain a high-risk group for TAVR. Even though patients with end-stage renal disease survive the procedure and initial hospitalization, they remain at high risk for early mortality and rehospitalization. And get this, future efforts should concentrate on identifying the factors associated with survival after TAVR in patients with end-stage renal disease so as to improve patient selection. And that's not all. The authors, most of whom are proponents of the procedure, write that given the high one-year mortality, this raises concerns regarding the benefit of treatment in this patient population. This reiterates to me the simple rule with TAVR is this. Is the patient sick because of aortic stenosis or is the patient sick with aortic stenosis? I think Patrice Wendling nailed the title of her uh, news column. It was this, just because TAVR can be done in end-stage renal disease, should it be offered at all? Take a look at this news story. I think it's excellent. That's it for this week in cardiology. As always, I'm grateful that you listened. Thank you. And remember, if you like this podcast, please tell a friend, consider writing a review, or giving us a five-star rating, and that way others can find us. Until next week, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org on Medscape.